weeks. Now, the Prime Minister is going to be holding her Cabinet meeting this week before the House of Commons begin a five-day debate on her withdrawal agreement, which the Brexit Secretary told us earlier here on Sunrise will definitely be voted on next Tuesday. But this morning we're asking, can the Prime Minister unite her own party behind her Brexit deal? With us to talk it over, two Conservative MPs on different sides of the debate, Dr Sarah Wollaston and Crispin Blunt. Good morning to you Good both. Um, Sarah Wollaston, I'll come to you first, if I may. Do you think the Prime Minister's got any chance this week after the festive break to unite her party and get those MPs who don't like her deal on board? I'm afraid I don't think there's any possibility that the Prime Minister will get her deal through Parliament. And I think Parliament has reached an impasse. That, that is the reality of the situation we face. And um, Crispin Blunt, I'll ask you the same question. From what you've heard since MPs returned to Westminster yesterday, have any changed their stance over the festive period? Uh, none that I've detected. And <clears throat> it's plain that the agreement she's proposing is obviously so very much worse uh, than leaving the European Union and moving to World Trade Organization terms. Uh, it's going to be almost impossible for her to convince uh, people like me that since we're on a default option to move to those terms, why should we opt for something that's very much worse? Uh, it's interesting, Sarah Williston, we keep hearing about the Prime Minister talking to Brussels this week, getting reassurances for MPs to get them on board. Uh, an exchange of letters has been talked about in, in the newspapers today. In fact, the Irish Prime Minister, uh, Leo Varadkar, uh, released a quote earlier uh, saying that he would give the UK reassurances because he doesn't want anyone to be trapped in anything, to be trapped in a backstop specifically. So with him saying that, is there some light at the end of this tunnel for the Prime Minister? And would those reassurances, letters for example, be enough reassurance for MPs, I do don't you think? think anyone expects that that will be enough because there won't be any changes to the legal text and that's what's at the heart of this. Uh, but I think on a wider note, there are also great divisions because very many of us are deeply opposed to no deal. There's going to be an amendment um, to the Finance Bill today to, which will, will address that. Um, letters from MPs stressing that of all the scenarios, no deal, uh, which is where we could be heading if we run out of road in just 80 days' time, would be absolutely absolutely catastrophic for our economy, for individuals and communities and, and Parliament absolutely will do everything it can to stop that happening. Yeah, uh, Crispin Blunt, an interesting few days ahead, obviously these reassurances, letters if they've got these verbal reassurances aren't legally binding, as Sarah Williston pointed out. We've also got talk in the newspapers of the UK putting feelers out to pause Article 50. Some suggestion the vote on Tuesday uh, could be postponed again. The Brexit Secretary has denied that. What do you see the path ahead looking like? Well, the path ahead has got to be giving reassurance to people as to what World Trade Organization terms means and the move to that. Uh, Peter Lilly did a very good job <clears throat> on this yesterday with his paper addressing some of the concerns and you need to ask Sarah uh, when she makes those assertions about no deal being unacceptable and some of the consequences she was identifying why those consequences would actually happen and the, the truth is of course uh, if Parliament rejects the Prime Minister's uh, withdrawal agreement uh, then uh, we default to moving to World Trade Organization terms the European Union and ourselves then have to not only surface the preparations, which is already happening on both sides, uh, but then they've got to start talking about all the little mini deals that we put in place to make sure that some of the uh, exaggerated anxieties and consequences that Sarah might try to point towards uh, obviously won't happen, which some of which, for example, yesterday was being addressed by the Health Secretary, making perfectly clear that, of course, the supply of pharmaceuticals and drugs to the UK uh, would continue. Uh, why wouldn't it? Well, I could put that to Sarah Wollaston, but you put it uh, to her perfectly well. Um, Sarah Wollaston, how would you respond to that? Uh, and no right. deal being completely unacceptable with what some people, yourself included, no doubt, are calling catastrophic consequences. Mm -hmm. Where's the evidence of that? Well, there is evidence. I mean, just looking at the government's own analysis of this, that, that we'd be voting knowingly and deliberately to make our economy around 9% worse off than it would be in 15 years' time. And let, even before you get to the short-term consequences, and I sit simply don't agree with Crispin that there wouldn't be consequences for patients, that there's no Brexit scenario that would be of benefit to the NHS, um, medical research, That's a um, social care. It's, it would it's, be a not, it's not because we're often talking about this in terms of just WTO rules. It's not just about WTO rules, it's about the friction at borders. It's about disruption to complex supply chains. It's about businesses in my constituency and all around the country who are telling us 
that the, this would have very serious consequences for them. And the Conservatives used to be the, the party championing businesses. How can we, how can any responsible Conservative-led government um, deliberately and knowingly ask its MPs to make their constituents and businesses poorer? It, it's unthinkable. Crispin Blunt, perhaps I could ask you to respond to this. This is from the former Brexit Secretary David Davis this morning. He said that the EU is testing the mettle of the British government, um, but they will come back to negotiate at the last possible moment if the UK holds firm. Well, all of that we'll have to, we'll have to, have to wait and see. But uh, I've been saying for uh, nearly two years now, having produced a report when I chaired the Foreign Affairs Committee, that we need to be ready for there to be no agreement. Uh, if uh, either the European Parliament or the British Parliament was faced with a result of the negotiation uh, that was very injurious to either of them, obviously they were going to reject it. That's the position the UK now finds itself in. It's not remotely surprising that the British Parliament is going to say no to the, with the withdrawal agreement because of the terms imposed on the United Kingdom. And therefore, we now need to look at what the implications are of moving uh, straight to World Trade Organization terms on the 29th of March. And uh, Sarah seems to be withdrawing slightly from her, her claims about catastrophe and uh, endorsing claims of, sort of economic Armageddon if we, if we go over on the 20, 29th of March. That it is simply not going to happen. And if you examine each of the, uh, the, the different areas and what actually would happen in both the interests of the EU and ourselves to manage that process uh, sensibly, we're going to get through this uh, perfectly OK. There will be some difficulties, of course there will be, um, but in the uh, medium to long term, uh, those of us who voted for uh, for Brexit, um, uh, plainly of the view that uh, free okay. trade agreements around the world is going to provide our country with greater opportunities than remaining in the European Union, where we're only ever half in or half out of it. Okay. Now, instead of uh, refighting that decision, time. we um, now need we now need to get on and face what is going to happen over the next uh, two or three months okay. and and manage people's uh, anxiety and not uh, raise okay. it. Well, that's events going on inside Parliament, very heated. Uh, what's going on outside Parliament, very heated as well. While I've both got you here, I just want to ask for your views on what the Conservative MP, uh, your fellow colleague Anna Soubry, uh, was subjected to as she left Abingdon Green on her way into the Houses of Parliament. Abuse hurled at her by those men that you are seeing there. Um, a lot of people on the side of Anna Soubry saying that, you know, police should offer greater protection. 50 MPs have written a letter to the head of Metropolitan Police to the effect. But we've had a, a, a couple of tweets in from viewers this morning saying it's quite hard for them to find sympathy with Anna Soubry and the abuse held to her when when you look at PMQs every week some of the abuse that's hurled across the aisles from MPs to one another really you know um, is doesn't is not a high standard so how, how can how can they support Anna Soubry I just want to get your thoughts on that Sarah Williston well I think Anna Soubry handled that situation with great dignity yesterday and this is orchestrated deliberate intimidation and it's not just directed at MPs it's directed against broadcasters look at what happened to uh, to, to Kay um, and, and other female broadcasters in particular and it happens to peacefully um, demonstrating members of the public so what we absolutely expect the, the pe people to be able to do is to exercise their right to free speech and that applies to the public to broadcasters and MPs and they should not be subjected to this kind of orchestrated deliberate intimidation. Yeah Mr Blunt your views I mean there's I suppose there's, there's one thing hurling abuse and name calling across the across the aisle in Parliament and um, being a couple of inches from somebody's face and doing it on the street. Uh, you're quite right and Sarah's obviously quite right about the, the tolerance that's required. And b both sides have got to show uh, tolerance of each other's points of view, and that's what uh, debate is about. But within the House of Commons, obviously, there are uh, centuries of procedure of one sort or another uh, laid down in order to Should manage MPs debate their between, own conduct, uh, you think? Because I'm just thinking MPs. of some of the language that's been used in Brexit against the Prime Minister, for example. Talk about knives and, and yes, killings. Yes, and, so, and, and all of that nonsense has been... Uh, off the record and is obviously nonsense and should never that language uh, should never be used on or off the record 
Uh, but within, but you, if you, if you simply look at the House of Commons, you know there are red lines down either side of the uh, of the chamber, which uh, go back to history about being a, at least a sword's length apart from your your opponents. Um, Parliament is the the centrepiece of our democracy. It's where the debate of the people's representatives takes place, and plainly, opinions are often often uh, very strongly held, and debate can become heated. And that's why we have procedures in order uh, properly to control it. Uh, now that needs to be be done in Parliament and respect needs to be shown and equally it must be shown on the streets where people, uh, uh, even when they are demonstrating uh, deeply held opinions, uh, it is very important that those uh, are expressed uh, sensibly and with a tolerance to the fact that uh, there are many people in the country who have a very different point of view. OK, but there are, there are ways to express those views and perhaps what we saw outside Parliament is not appropriate at all. Crispin Blunt and Sarah Willison, thank you very much indeed.